seven young women were dead. A young man was convicted of one of the murders and the serial killing stopped. But for those who lived through the two-year killing spree, it's never truly ended, especially for those who had close calls. Here's Rob Wolchek with the conclusion of the Michigan murders. Here, LaMonica, you're about to hear from three women who've never told their stories on TV before. Two met the killer 50 years ago. One saw him as recently as last year. All of them say John Norman Collins still haunts them. An individual like this is not someone who, on the surface, appears to be very peculiar and bizarre. It's someone who might appear rather normal. I've been looking for a woman to save my life. It's the spring semester of 1969 at Eastern Michigan University. An athletic student named John chats up 18-year-old freshman Rana in line at the bank near campus. John likes motorcycles, so does Rana. Rana heads back to her dorm on foot. He came up beside me in his car, and he was just kind of following me home, you know? I said, no, no, really, I'm okay. Rana finally gives in after a block and hops in. John promises to take her for a ride the next day on his triumph. Most of the time that I saw him was riding motorcycles. He'd pick me up from class. Rana was always with her classmates when John would get her. They thought he seemed nice. John liked to take Rana riding the back roads past the woods and farms and abandoned barns. We were always riding down Getty's Road and we'd stop at this old farmhouse. Getty's Road, which seems now a murder thoroughfare, it leads to most of the places where the bodies have been discovered. And I said, John, I just saw something. This is where they've been finding bodies. And he said, yeah, I know. Um, you want to go look for some? You never suspected him. I never did. Rana went back home to her parents' house for the summer. And then... John Norman Collins has been arrested and charged with the murder of Karen Sue Bynum. When I saw his picture on TV and just kind of took a breath and said, oh my God, this can't be. Rhonda said John never laid a hand on her. Then again, she always had friends around whenever John showed up. I thank my lucky stars all the time. I just figure I had someone watching over me. I was totally in shock. Pam remembers John Collins as well, but he was no gentleman with her. I had gotten up and put on my little hippie outfit. Pam was a 20-year-old University of Michigan student. She was walking one day in the spring of 69 near campus. A very immaculately clean, shiny blue car cut me off. I noticed the driver immediately, and my first impulse was, oh God, it's a frat. <laughs> I don't want to have anything to do with a short hair, is exactly what I was thinking. Pam had a job after school at the hospital, and she had to change her clothes before work. And he said, come on, get in the car, let's go for a ride. And my big mistake was I pointed right to my house and said, I don't need a ride, I live right there. And then he really took on a strange kind of a look, because as soon as I said no, his demeanor changed. The driver lost his cool. And he said, you mother ugly aren't you gonna get in the car with me? He was furious at me. And when I tell you, he peeled, he backed away, and he peeled away as fast as he could. But the story. It gets real creepy. Doesn't end there took off my hippie clothes to put my straight clothes on to go to work, never thinking anything about what had happened earlier in the afternoon. And that next morning, I got up and my clothes were gone. Really? My clothes, my hippie clothes were gone. Pam said after Colin's arrest for murder, she went to the police. She says they told her they'd found her clothes in a barn. When you went and talked to him and you looked in his eyes. Yes. What did you think? Did you think I he... don't like the look of his eyes. This is Shannon. Her husband died of cancer and she was vulnerable and sad. A family member suggested she write a longtime family friend who was in prison. They said he was railroaded. Three years ago, Shannon finally wrote to the family friend, John Collins. First, I got to know 
this man that was very charming, very nice. We talked about sports. I was just a pen pal, he said. Shannon traveled up to Marquette to the 140-year-old prison to visit John Norman Collins. And I was like really, really nervous. What did you talk about? Everything from his mother to um, Ann Arbor. He swore up and down. You know, he's an honest man. He's telling the truth. And Soon, John started just... calling, sending her cards, letters, suggestive love notes. She tried to trick me, tried to romance me. He charmed me. And it worked for a while. Remember, John Collins was the guy who got Karen Bynaman on his motorcycle. Seemed like such an upstanding guy. He was never even a suspect 50 years ago, even though he looked just like the composites of the man last seen with some of the victims. John has always claimed to be innocent, now and after his trial. Len Collins said that I never knew a girl named Karen Sue Bynaman. I never took her to my uncle's basement. I never killed Karen Sue Bynaman. In that very special way. He is not going to admit it. Shannon says he told her what she calls half-truths about everything. She cut all ties with Collins last year, but he still tries to reach her. You think he's guilty? Oh, yeah. There is no doubt in my mind. Shannon says she made a big mistake contacting Collins and warns others that he's still stalking women as best he can from behind bars. Here for a good year and a half, he had me under his spell, is what I call it. John Collins was charged with murder in California for the strangulation of Roxy Phillips. But after his conviction for murdering Karen Bynaman here in Michigan, politics kept the killer from ever being extradited. Collins was never tried for any of the other dead girls. But everyone I spoke with believes he was the one who lured girls to their deaths one after another. The rookie cop who identified the man on the motorcycle. I mean, do you feel like you're kind of a part of history because of that whole thing? I think so, yeah. That You're proud of what? Absolutely, that you did something good. The retired county sheriff who thinks Collins was really killing his mother when he killed the girl. Every girl had long, dangly earrings. His mother always wore long, dangly earrings, and so did his sister. Uh, that wasn't no coincidence. Kay, who's lived a life without her friend, Dawn Basom. My friend didn't get to be a mom, didn't get to be a great grandma, or even a grandma. And I, I do, I think about that a lot. And Cheryl, who remembers Dawn playing with her brother in front of her house on LaForge Road. They stopped and waved at us, and that's my last memory of Dawn. And Greg, who lived through it all 50 years ago as an EMU student and spent days reliving the crimes with me. Karen Sue Bynaman wrapped in a blanket, grabs the end of the blanket, pulls it back, and she tumbles down the hill. The author, who spent the last five years knee-deep in murder, finally breaks down. And meeting uh, Mary Fleischer's parents. That got me too. They're no longer finding mutilated bodies of pretty teenagers discarded on the leafy roads of Washtenaw County, but there are still reminders. Dawn Basom's house is still there. It's now a college rental filled with students. And young sorority girls now live in what was John Collins' home on Emmett Street. For some reason, I feel as though that might be arousing to the despicable murderer who preyed on that very type of girl. Joan Shell's house. Mary Fleischer's apartments are still there, and the house where Karen Bynaman was tortured and murdered 50 years ago this week may look different, but it's still there. And the roads are still there, like scars on the landscape. Sometimes it's hard for me to drive down Gale Road. Sometimes it's hard for me to go down the forge. The roads still haunt. This is where they found the body of Don Basom. It's been 50 long years and a lot has changed. But one thing that hasn't changed is this area. It's still pretty isolated. 
and pretty creepy. No one that lived through the two years of terror in Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor has ever truly healed. And how could they? So young. I mean, they were all young. I wrote to John Norman Collins. He never responded. We also had the Department of Corrections send someone to his cell to ask him if he'd like to speak with me about this story. John said, no way. I also asked one of Shannon's relatives, who speaks with Collins often, to ask John to call me. He has it. John Norman Collins has been locked up for almost 50 years. He will never be released. Our hearts go out to the families of these young girls who died so painfully. But I can't help think, too, of the evil that sometimes lurks among us mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. under the guise of a normal, everyday human being. Like I was saying, in a mask of sanity, uh, I believe this is a guy who was truly an evil person and truly in his soul as an evil person and wore a mask of sanity so that he appeared to be a normal college student, a normal person, even continuing today with Shannon, who was a pen pal who mm -hmm. he somehow romanced and, yeah. and sucked in. So this is a bad guy, and he's locked away, and the good news is, is that he's gone forever. Um, but then again, so are all those poor victims, those poor victims and all the people that have lived their whole lives without their friends and their relatives. It's, it's really been a, quite an experience doing this story. Yeah, and, and I just got the chills listening to those women that had the close calls with, mm -hmm. with oh, yeah. him. The fact that they look back and flash back, you know, it could have been them. Mm -hmm. And those women feel as though they've been blessed. They've lived their lives. Both of those two ladies said they feel like they've been blessed. They looked evil in the eye, and they beat it, so they're not scared of anything anymore, mm -hmm. which is kind of good. There is no statute of limitations when it comes to murder. There's still a case in California for which he could be tried. Is there a chance he could be tried out there and possibly get the death penalty? They say Michigan's never letting go of him. And I know they also have some DNA evidence now, so. Well, Rob, this was an amazing yeah, really report. really powerful. Absolutely. Really well, thanks. We worked hard on it. A lot, lot of credit to, to a lot of great people here at Fox, too. Yeah, and um, thanks to all those folks for coming forward absolutely. and yeah. telling and, and story. Yeah, and them, too, of course. Okay. Right. Thank thanks, you. Rob. Thanks, Rob. Thanks.